Good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, I am uh, Chandranath Sen. I am a neurosurgeon at NYU. And uh, first and foremost, I am a board member of the Cordoma Foundation. And uh, I lead, I'm fortunate to lead the Medical Advisory Board. So um, jo Josh asked me to give a little perspective on my take on the journey with uh, Cordoma. So I thought I would share some thoughts and um, a few minutes with you. Uh, I promise I won't bore you. So uh, first of all, I must say that I am totally uh, amazed that so many people assembled together just to talk about Cordomas. That itself is a, it's, it's a, uh, it's a phenomenal task. And it says a lot to what this organization has done. It's not a bad turnout considering that this is an orphan disease and such a rare disease that affects one in a million. And uh, it is truly remarkable we have presence from all over the world and world-class scientists today. So when I was uh, reminiscing a little bit, I thought about my training. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm, I'm so old that I'm standing here today giving a, uh, a view on my take on history. But um, uh, 30 years ago, uh, or 31 years ago, when I was in training in neurosurgery uh, at the University of Wisconsin, I was chief resident. And the entire year, I saw one case of a cordoma. And that's a university program. It's a training program. So you can imagine, unfortunately, to this day, uh, most neurosurgeons will see about that many cases, even now. And certainly, as you can see, that doesn't make you proficient or an expert at it. So that's the nature of this disease that we are dealing with. It's a rarity, which makes it so hard to deal with. Uh, so uh, when I think back of my practice um, with Cordoma patient over the years, I've been fortunate to interact with many people. Some of you are seated here. And the difficulty always that I faced was how do I connect these patients to a peer group or somebody that they can talk to, to ask like, what do I face? What is my life going to be like? What does the surgery feel like? There was no support group. There was no information out there. I would say no information out there even for physicians and scientists, leave alone for patients. So uh, this, was, this was a repeated, repeated picture that I saw when I treated patients. I can always give my perspective on it, but the patient feels most comfortable when they sit with their peer group and, and find out and talk to them. How are you feeling? What do I do if this happens? Who do I ask? Nothing like that existed. Even it didn't even exist that there was a concept that things have to be treated in a cohesive manner by multiple disciplines, by different physicians. So that was not even at that time felt. I mean, I remember working with uh, Dr. Liebs, and I, would, uh, I was at the University of Pittsburgh those days, and I would send the patient all the way there for treatment because no other proton therapy center existed. The next one that came up online was in Loma Linda in California. So that's how difficult it was for any of you who may have faced the disease in those days. So, you know, another good thing I've uh, seen in my life um, because of this type of practice, that every patient has left a mark in my mind and their life. So it's become a part of my life. In fact, I can remember probably most of my patients by face, if not always by name. So in 2002, I met a young boy, a seven-year-old boy, who came with his mother to see me. She came, he came a long distance. And he had a clival cordoma. And um, I was very impressed by this young man. Uh, I, in fact, I'd never met or seen somebody of his like. So he's only seven. Um, 
He left an indelible impression on my mind. He was so grown up and so mature about it. And he had already undergone one surgery. So it's not that he was naive to this whole process. He knew about the disease. He knew about the pain of the operation. So here we were sitting considering a second operation, and which was going to be even harder on it. So I was going to have a very frank discussion. So I asked him uh, if he wanted to leave the room. But he didn't. He wanted to be there, part of this discussion. He was a tough, tough young man, amazing young man. And he left a mark on my heart. I used to see him and Heather and Steve, who are here, so often. Unfortunately, the poor guy, uh, after multiple operations and radiation and chemotherapy and the pain of all this, uh, got beaten by this tumor. But, but, that wasn't the end of the story. That was just the beginning. He had sown a seed in Steve and Heather that something has to be done about this disease. So here I'm going on in my life and my practice. Uh, in 2006, an uh, 18 year old boy comes with his mother for an opinion to see me. He's come a long distance. And he also has a clival cordoba. And um, he's very strong, tough, highly intelligent, and totally in control. I guess you're getting a drift who it might be. <laughs> this was Josh Summer. So I almost felt like deja vu. I said, this looks like Justin. 18 years old. So he did well, fortunately. Then Josh, his mother, Heather, Steve, and a few others got together. And that was the beginning of the Cordoma Foundation. So it was conceived in Heather's dining room on the dining table. Repeated meetings and conversations. So I've been privileged to be part of this show for many years. Uh, I think that it would be a, an understatement for me to say that the Cordoma Foundation has tackled the bull by the horn. It has really addressed this topic so systematically and so methodically, starting with what makes this cell tick? Why is this cell the way it is? And then now we are getting to the point of what shall we do to treat it? That's quite a progression, if you think that it only started 10 years ago. And I have been in this business for 31 years now. Uh, they've created an outstanding website that if you look at it, and it is an access, thank God, everybody has access to computers these days. No patient has to feel like an orphan anymore, like they used to feel those days. They don't have to feel like they're alone swimming in this uncharted water with nobody to guide them, nobody to hold their hand, and nobody to commiserate with. That is totally not the case now. Huge difference in a 30 year, in a 10 year time period. I don't even want to think 30 years. This year, we are starting clinical trials. So you heard from Mr. Beckman who said, obviously, it needs lots of support, lots of money, but a lot of guidance to take it in the right direction. Not a penny gets wasted in this foundation. I'll tell you that, having been part of this thing, every bit of it goes miles, goes a long way. This is an extremely well-run, 
well thought out organization. I have worked with enough professional people in my years that I can tell you this is a group to bet on. This is a horse to bet on. The last two days you have seen tremendous amount of signs. I mean, it's really a lot of it, uh, as I have told some other people, as a surgeon, um, a lot of the details go over my head. I'm not embarrassed to acknowledge that in front of you all. But this would have been an unimaginable thing even five years ago. So just look at you, those who are patients in this room, that you have hope, you have something to look forward to. There is something happening. Every, every year when we have these discussions and meetings, it's very, very impressive the quantum jump each year takes at what we are thinking, what we are talking about, what we know, and what there is to know, and what we don't know. So Josh has been the heart and soul of this organization. But you know, he cannot do it, just the heart and soul cannot live, right? So we need all the other parts of the body. Same thing, he has had an amazing group of diehard stalwarts. I'm not even going to begin to name them because I feel I will offend people by leaving some out. But I, needless to say, they have been amazing. I know almost all of them, except for some of the new people in the organization. But I will tell you, each one of them devotes uh, a lot of energy and time and heart to it. But it all comes to the leader, right? The leader sets the tone. The lead drummer sets the rhythm. And that's what Josh is. His passion and enthusiasm is infectious. One phone call you get from him and he say yes before you know even what you said yes to. It happened to me a few times, then I start thinking, oh God, what did I say? <laughs> so maybe I'll take it back or do something else. But he can't say no to Josh. He's a single-handed juggernaut and everything he touches, he can do it. I've, I've never met somebody like that. You know, I, I, when I talk to my patients, I deal with my patients, I say I learn as much from my patients as they get from me. So it's really a two-way street. Same thing goes with Josh. You know, he is he's infectious. I've learned so much from him. So, now Josh has gone, he's, he's not just happy with his own family, he has now got a fiance, but he has gone ahead and created an extended family. And that's what we are all today here. So, it's truly been a privilege for me to be part of this, a small part of this thing, but it's been an amazing journey, a rocket ship. So I'm not going to delay, I'll introduce Josh Summer to you. You all know him. <laughs> 